Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is a Ukraine war news update, the third part thereof because it was such a big geopolitical segment I had to split it off because I end up ranting quite a lot about this numpty over there. Uh, and I, I'm I'm sorry that I'm somewhat unprofessional about saying that, but that's really what I believe, so I'm not going to lie to you. Um, he is indeed a numpty. Anyway, you can look forward to listening to that part later in this segment. Take it away, me. Moving on to geopolitical stuff, and my, there's a lot to talk about, as you can see. European Commission recommends, and I reported this yesterday in a breaking news piece, recommends starting the process of the negotiations on Ukraine's and Moldova's accession to the European Union, according to Ursula von der Leyen, the EC president. According to her, Ukraine has implemented 90% of the necessary reforms to become an EU candidate. Today is a historic day, um, said von der Leyen, because today the Commission recommends that the Council open succession negotiations with Ukraine and with Moldova, uh, she said. Now, the question is, what happens next? And actually, this won't be quick. So uh, there were claims that Charles Michel said that the target date of 2030 was on the cards, but a lot of people saying it's highly unlikely Ukraine will be able to accede to the EU by 2030. When you look at p places like, was it Turkey been waiting 36 years and it's pretty much been put on on the back burner now uh croatia took a long time it's like you know you're looking at a decade really unless things are 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 done incredible expedited incredibly well um so many see the 2030 date as overly ambitious uh negotiating for croatia which in 2013 became the most recent country uh, to join eu they took that took six years and that's probably a lot less complicated uh, than than ukraine but anyway uh what happens next well um on the 4th of november ursula von der leyen visited kiev uh and announced that ukraine had fulfilled 90 percent of the necessary uh you know hoops to jump through and these requirements included implementing legislation on the selection procedure for judges to the constitutional court of ukraine finalizing the integrity of uh, vetting of the candidates for the high council of justice members and the high qualification commission of judges in ukraine strengthening the fight against corruption appointing a new head of specialized anti-corruption prosecutor's office and a new director of anti uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, uh, ensuring anti-money laundering legislation compiled with the standards of Financial Action Task Force, adopting a strategic plan for the reform of the entire law enforcement sector, implementing in the anti-oligarch law, adopting a media law, and finalising the reform of the legal framework for national minorities. So uh, there's still much to do, however... Um, in addition, the government conducted a so-called self-screening. We analysed 28,000 EU legal acts to check their implementation into Ukraine's legal framework. I sincerely thank everyone who carried out this enormous work in such a short time. That's Denis Shmihal, the uh, the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they uh, three areas require further attention. Legislation related to national minorities, anti-corruption measures and lobbying regulations to meet European standards as part of the anti-oligarch action plan. Oh, I wonder if those lobbying regulations could be uh, exported to the US. Um, hashtag just saying. Uh, so anyway, there there's lots still to do. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Hungary are still going to have uh, a part to play in that we'll see how long it takes uh obviously over the next years but it's going to be interesting to see um whether it can be expedited in any way not in a kind of dodgy way but in you know can ukraine work really hard to to get these things achieved moldova it's important that moldova's in there as well and i think the links between moldova and ukraine uh, are strengthening that's going to be interesting especially when you've got transnistria there but also georgia became a candidate uh nation for eu accession which i think is important especially since georgia dream the ruling party there at the moment is trying to force the country to drift away and back under the influence 
of uh, the Kremlin. So it it is it is a it was a landmark day yesterday. There's an awful lot of analysis that I could do. Maybe I'll keep that for an extra uh, because as you can see here, a huge amount of content to discuss with regard to because it's a really complex thing, right? Getting into the EU. Uh, what else can be said? Well. Ukraine cannot be accepted into the EU since war will come with it, said Hungarian Foreign Minister Sicciato, uh, commenting on the EC report on EU enlargement. Quote, Ukraine is in a state of war, so we can see that neither freedom of speech nor freedom of expression is respected. <laughs> uh, uh, freedom of speech in Hungary. Yeah, because you've done such a great job with your, your press and um, democratic institutions. Anyway. And elections are not held either. Yeah, because it's constitutionally, you know, it's under martial law. It's been invaded by Russia. Oh, goodness me. Come on, guys. It would be obviously absurd for EU member states to take a position on how Ukraine functions in such conditions in uh, institutions of the rule of law. I'm not sure about that. It is absolutely clear that as long as Ukraine is at war, it is not suitable for EU membership. So we can see where Hungary are positioning themselves. Right. Moving from that topic to e to the UK imposing sanctions on companies that help finance war in Ukraine. It's really great that this continues. It's an evolving thing that when you put sanctions on, then every so many people will fight to to find loopholes that you then got to close those loopholes and see where else that there are issues. And it's just a continuing thing. It's not like sanctions are in place, right? That's it. Off down a pub. So James Cleverly, the UK Foreign Secretary, has announced that sanctions continue to deal a heavy blow to the Kremlin's war economy to date, depriving Putin of over $400 billion to fund his illegal invasion of Ukraine. But we must keep tightening the screws on Moscow. Today, sanctions will help those who have provided succor to Putin in help by helping him to lessen the impact of our sanctions on Russian gold and oil, two critical sources of revenue for the Russian war machine. As we root out and close down these circumvention avenues, we'll continue to box Putin in and make sure his faltering war effort in Ukraine ends in failure. Um, so among those sanctioned in, in this run of sanctions are two of Russia's largest gold producers, Nord Gold PLC and Highland Gold Mining Limited, alongside Russian oligarchs Vladislav uh, Sviblov and Konstantin Strukov. The UK has also put restrictions on Paramount Energy and Commodities, DMCC company, which is known to employ opaque ownership structures and has been used by Russia to soften the blow of oil-related sanctions imposed by the UK in coordination with G7 partners. So exactly what I was talking about in, in trying to close down these loopholes and find uh, the ways that, that Russia is getting around the sanctions. Right. Okay, talking about sanctions, in this, in this case, US sanctions, Ru Russian propagandists are having a, a bit of a a wobbly on national te television. Russian public propagandists are agitated. Frozen Russian assets will go to Ukraine to be used for war with Russia. They don't like that at all. So what's this? Well, the US Congress has approved a bill to transfer Russia frozen Russian assets to Ukraine. The Foreign Affairs Committee, the US House of Representatives, has voted in favor of a bill to, on the transfer of Russian assets to Ukraine. The initiative envisages authorizing the US Secretary of State to provide additional aid to Ukraine using assets confiscated from the Bank of Russia or other foreign assets of the country. Peskov on attempts to confiscate Russian assets has said this is illegal it contradicts all possible rules it will of course be challenged and challenged indefinitely by our country this will entail very serious legal and judicial costs for those who make such decisions and use such decisions of course we will also be working on countermeasures that are unlikely to be mirror-like but they will be what they will be okay uh, a couple of things to note there that how long can they keep challenging this? Because they will challenge it, as he says, indefinitely. Does that mean that it'll never actually come to fruition? And secondly, what can they do to Western corporations or entities uh, along a similar vein? And will it have anything like the kind of effect that sanctions have going the other way? Right. Uh, continuing on US politics, and we're going to spend a bit of time on that. Oh, look who's arrived in Kiev today. So this is Tim White talking about a light Secretary Pete. So this is Pete Buttigieg and his performance at the primaries last time round. Spoke a lot of sense and in touch with the younger voters in the US. He's now Transport Secretary. So Pete Buttigieg, this is my opinion. I like Pete Buttigieg. He's really good. And in fact, if I had my way, he would be the Democrat uh, candidate for um, for president. And I think he'd make a really good president. When you see him on things like Fox News, so he likes to go into the lion's den. 
and he he spits fire. He he's really very good. He knows his onions, and he is a good talker. He's just he's just a good politician. And him going to Ukraine is interesting because actually there's a lot of infrastructure uh, discussion that could be had and a lot of uh, work that America could do with Ukraine to support Ukraine's infrastructure, both now and going forward in terms of rebuilding. So U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg made a surprise visit to Kiev. Robert Mariner, who performed engineering work for the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy, is going to serve as transportation advisor to Ukraine, Buttigieg announced in Kiev. And of course, I've talked to you many times about how this is a positive sum game. It's not like these people are going to be put put into position just for the benefit of Ukraine. This will be for the benefit of the U.S. as well. Now, holy guacamole. I thought I couldn't like this person any less until the Republican presidential primaries for, um, debates took place again last night. Third one. Third one took place last night, again without Donald Trump. He's spending obviously too much time in courtrooms at the moment to be able to, to turn up to these. But man, Vivek Ramaswamy is a Grade A plonker. He's an absolute. Do I swear? He's a cockwomble, right? It's just. I'm sorry, that's really um, not professional, but he's a cockwomble. Uh, so, Ramaswamy attacking Ukraine calls Zelensky a Nazi. Like, he is essentially. He is essentially a, a pro Kremlin entity. He saying Russian talking points and he needs to be shut down. He needs to be, no, he needs to be debated by someone who knows what they're talking about. Mr. Ramaswamy, are you persuaded by President Zelensky's urgent new plea? Where do you stand on more funding? I'm absolutely unpersuaded. And I'm actually enjoying watching the Ukraine hawks quietly, delicately tiptoe back from their position as this thing has unwound into a disaster. The first half of this... Uh, I don't think it has unwound into a disaster. I think Ukraine are in a much better position now than they have been at any point in this war. So, uh, if that's your definition of disaster, then you're an Egypt. I was the only person standing for it. Now they're actually quietly coming around to being more cautious as they should. Level with the American people here. Ukraine is not a paragon of democracy. Level with the American people here, he says, and then... And then his idea of levelling with the American people is, is spouting, vomiting disinformation. They're not a paragon of democracy. No, they're not a paragon of democracy. No one said that. But they are democratic and they're fighting tooth and nail to, to improve their democratic standing. Just have a not... What have I just talked about with regard to what they've done in terms of accession to the EU? The EU would never have them if they weren't, uh, weren't doing a damn good job of implementing democratic institutions and mechanisms. This is a country that has banned 11 opposition parties. It is consolidated... Because they're at war, and those opposition parties are the opposition parties who are pro-Russian, who are Kremlin parties. Go and do your history. Go and look at what happened in World War Two. In uh, go and look at uh, in the UK Parliament. Like this is what happens in wartime. You don't invite into your Parliament the other side's political representation while you're fighting in a war with them. God damn it! all media into one state TV media arm. That's not democratic. It is threatened not to hold elections this year unless the U.S. forks over more money. That is not. No, that's not. That's not what happened at all. Democratic. It has celebrated a Nazi in its ranks. The comedian in cargo pants, a man called Zelensky. Do so he's calling Zelensky a Nazi. He's calling the Jewish president of Ukraine a Nazi. I think I personally I'd love to just sue him for for slander. I was just like. I'd love to do that. Just like, hey, you want to say that? I'm taking you to court, mate. You like a bit of litigation in the US? Let, let's do it, mate. And let, also, I'm going to challenge you on everything else you're saying as well. Doing it in their own ranks. That is not democratic. More he calls him a comedian in cargo pants. This is basically this. Like, why would he want to do this? Why would he want to? You've got 
Ah, oh, you've got Russia invading Ukraine, and he's looking at those two people. And he's going, "Oh, Putin and Zelensky," and he's not said a single thing about Putin. He's not said one moral evaluation of Putin there, and he's picked you. He's picked the Ukrainian president and said he's a Nazi and he's a comedian in cargo pants. That is entirely Russian talking points. Why would you want to do that? What is your agenda if you are saying that? You are morally abhorrent in so doing. You're a slimy. Uh, sn snake oil salesman here, and and I'm not having any of it. Facts for you that you won't hear from the main. That's not facts, and th what you're saying is is a warped interpretation of reality. Mainstream in either party or the mainstream media, the regions of Ukraine that are occupied by Russia right now in the Donbas, Luhansk, Donetsk. These are Russian-speaking regions that have not even been part of Ukraine since 2014, that other people probably couldn't name those provinces for you. Right, he's saying that mainstream media hadn't talked about this. Jesus Christ, mate. Go and watch mainstream media because you don't have a Scooby-Doo, right? Also, why have they not been part of Ukraine since 2014, Sunshine? Why not? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because they were illegally annexed due to an illegal little green men proxy invasion those are the hard facts and so okay tell me because they're russian speaking does that mean that they are pro-russian because i just want to know what your evidence for that is because last time i looked they voted for independence from russia with ukraine as did crimea luhansk donetsk and crimea all of them over 50 percent for ukraine are you just ignoring that and just saying oh they speak russian therefore do you know what do you know who speaks english americans thank you very much you're ours now vivek my friend you're american you speak english we're having you that's our language therefore it's our country of course that's nonsense my goodness, you're a detestable human being. Sort of frame this as some kind of battle between good versus evil. Don't buy it. And I'd like the likes. Of what do you have to say in your moral evalu evaluation of Putin? Because you seem to have not said anything. Just, just please let me know. Answers on the postcard. The, the sharpest of the war hawks on Ukraine, Nikki Haley, to have some accountability and answer. Do you want to use U.S. taxpayer money to fund the banning of Christians? That is actually what's happening. They're using the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. They have banned them. The Ukrainian parliament just did this last week. Do you know why they've done that? Do you know anything about that arm of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church? Do you know that they are a proxy of the the uh the russian orthodox church that they are that you've had priests that have been arrested for for spying for x y and z do you know anything about that which you were talking supported by our dollars and i think you owe it to the american people nikki to at least this mr. one time Ramaswamy, at least condemn, you, that's time. At least condemn Ramaswamy, their banning you. of christians mr. Ramaswamy. how about condemning Putin's removal of children from Russia. I don't see you condemning that. How about condemning the killing of citizens inside Ukraine consistently? How about condemning the massive, like, what are we up to now? 80,000 war crimes registered of Russia in Ukraine. How about you condemn that, you terrible, terrible human being? Anyway. Ukraine and Israel are frontline states against darkness, says Tendar. Uh, this is a question. Uh, this is not a question uh, whether to support one or the other. Both are fighting the same fight. Both are vital for U.S. and Western interests. See, I find this this could be more problematic. And, and the more you put Ukraine with Israel, the more you're opening yourself up not to get universal support for Ukraine because Israel is so divisive. So I would separate these two ideas out and these two conflicts out personally that's just my tuppence their victories will further bolster freedom and prosperity in the world i think that's contestable uh, but anyway we're, we're popping into this uh, video of nikki haley here now nikki haley interestingly i think well there's talk about her positioning herself into number two now uh, as, as a serious well, we'll come on to this in a second. Not a serious contender for, for Trump. There is no serious contender, unfortunately. But this is what she has to say. What is your take on more funding for Ukraine? 
I am telling you, Putin and President Xi are salivating at the thought that someone like that could become president. They would Boom. Love to the see fact that. of the matter is she doesn't answer So this the is what I will tell you. We're is, driving Russia all, into China's hands because of these foolish policies. You had your time policies. to talk. The ambassador has the floor. Ambassador, Thank you. Please. The first thing I'll tell you is we all remember what that thug did when he invaded Ukraine. We all know that half a million people have died because of Putin. And here is a freedom-loving, pro-American country that is fighting for its survival and its democracy. No, I don't think we should give them cash. I think we should give them the equipment and the ammunition to win. And I'll tell you, if Biden had done it when they first asked for it, this war would be over. But an interesting so if you're gonna if you're going to differentiate yourself from biden right which as a republican uh candidate or a nominee is 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 going to want to do then actually that's probably a sensible thing really hard to call criticize biden for not going strong enough and early enough i think that's a, that's a pretty good approach let's also remember this when you left Afghanistan in shambles and left them with a ton of weapons and money, it's not that we left, it's how we left. When you look at Ukraine, don't think for a second, now everybody wants to move away from Ukraine, they'll want to move away from Israel a year from now. America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends. After 9-11, we needed a lot of friends. Now is the time to get partnerships. This unholy alliance between Russia, Ukraine, and China is real. There is a reason that Taiwanese want us to support the Ukrainians. It's because they know that China is coming after them next. There is a reason Ukrainians want us to support Israelis because they know that if Iran wins, Russia wins. Ambassador. We have. To I, th I think that, that that's a good point about alliances, and I think there's too much kind of transactional thinking in some members. Uh, of in, with some politicians now uh, as uh, because I think this is so important because this is about what is getting uh, beamed out to the American public and the sort of people who be watching that debate w might be listening to Vivek Ramaswamy and and being taken in by that out outright nonsense well this is what Lawrence O'Donnell says about that debate and this is a pretty good analysis now he is MSNBC you know it's opposite end of the political spectrum but just i i think he's actually on the money with what he says here uh, so let's uh, just dip into that and i now see that that vivek is the mvp of the panel for this reason he makes everyone else look better than they were ever going to look because this is a good point that actually ramaswamy uh, is m making people like Nikki Haley sort of come to the front and be f far more heard and respected and reasonable. He's not just the most hated person by everyone on the stage. He's the most hateable character who's ever had a role in presidential debating in, in either party. And so he's helping them by being up there. He's making Nikki Haley look better, look stronger. He's making everybody up there. He's humanizing look, All of them <laughs> look better. But, you know, I mean, what this is the debate for, you know, in, in case Trump chokes on a cheeseburger. That, that's what this debate is. You know, if, if somehow uh, Trump falls out, <laughs> It's, it's going to be, you know, DeSantis or Haley. So but that's, isn't that's it the question, like. are they just waiting for him to die, go to jail, or drop out? Because well, no one's so, going after no, no, him. So, so fame, fame is its own currency now yes. in politics, especially in Republican politics, as Trump proved. So Vivek obviously is running for nothing but fame. Uh, Christie needs to push up his fame to see if there might be more money in some sort of ABC contract, you know. I really like what he says here. I think he's actually, this is the bit where, like, he looks at all the people left in a fight and says, actually, this is what they want out of it. This is what they want out of it. And only two people are serious about the political aspect of it. So Vivek Ramaswamy only wants fame. Chris Christie wants fame to get him himself a better job in TV punditry. You know, after this. Uh, and, and I think Haley and DeSantis are the two who think maybe we have a future, you know, four years from now, maybe. And, and so we want to play credibly here. Uh, and Tim Scott is going to go back to a quiet life uh, after this. Uh, and he's going to be a little more famous. And, and that might help him with a talk radio gig or something like that. My notes. So, I, yeah, 
I, I, th I think that was a pretty good analysis there. So, so something went wrong with this sound in, in, in my ears. I hope you could hear that. Um, but yeah, so Ramaswamy looking for fame. Chris Christie looking for fame for, for a job. Uh, thereafter, Tim Scott looking for a bit more of a, uh, a leg up in his own political uh, work. And then Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis possibly looking for four years time down the road to, to have a platform, a bigger platform from which they can launch a, a further presidential bid. Uh, Julia Davis here says Vivek's ignorant attacks against Ukraine and Zelensky will be all over Russian state TV. And I'm already loathing it. Uh, just, you know, um, something to say about his like tax dollars to going to Ukraine. So most of America's assistance to Ukraine is spent within the US. Uh, I talked about this yesterday and the day before this, you know, there is a lot of money that the US is giving to Ukraine, but they're not giving it to Ukraine. They're giving it to their own manufacturers to build stuff to go to Ukraine. And that's stimulus for jobs and so on and so forth. You can go and look at, at, at details for, for this kind of stuff in a number of different places. Brady Afric has a few analyses here. Um, uh, there you go. Anyway, let's. I want to leave Vivek Ramaswamy behind because he's just uh, gets my goat. Um, Lavrov was not allowed. There was one other video I was going to show you, but I won't. But actually, Nikki H he brings up Nikki Haley's daughter, and she says to him live on tv you are scum she said you are scum to Ve to vivek ramaswamy go and check it out and it's like wow that that's not been said in the presidential debate before but that is the extent to which R vivek ramaswamy has wound other people up now there'll be a lot of people who like ramaswamy and like what he says i'm sure there is out there but but he is essentially completely misinforming people on on what is really going on in that war and then pretending that no one's reporting it people you you won't even heard of luhansk on donetsk mainstream media don't report on it anyway they're russian-speaking places what about them it's like <sighs> dude come and watch my channel for a bit um lavrov uh, this is sergey lavrov the Russian foreign minister was not allowed into North Macedonia. Interesting. Balkan nation that's uh, balking at, uh, at Russian influence. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he planned to take part in the meeting of the OSCE foreign ministers. The head of the foreign ministry of North Macedonia said that the current uh, country's airspace is closed to Russian airplanes. Ouch. So you, it's such a weird place, the Balkans at the moment. You've got Serbia that seems to be very pro-Russia. You've got North Macedonia saying, nah, nah, nah. You've got Ru Romania that's kind of very pro-NATO in the West, but also has elements that are very pro-Russian inside. You've got Hungary uh, doing what Hungary are doing. Uh, uh, and then you've got Moldova. It's just, goodness me, right old mix of places at the moment. Um Right, Putin has arrived in Kazakhstan, talked about that uh, over the last few days. Russian President Putin has arrived there for talks with the Kazakh counterpart to strengthen neighborliness and cooperation, as Jean France Press reported uh, yesterday. The Kazakh president said ahead of the visit that his country is ready to increase the transport capacity of Russian oil and gas. This is this thing where, like, yeah, we're going to move away from you, Russia, in terms of your influence over us. But, uh, by the way, we'll... Uh, Buy your oil and gas cheaply because I know you're struggling to sell that in, that in other places. Well, on that subject, and finally, India has saved... Not finally, this has happened. Oh, finally, India saved some money. No, I mean, finally, you, I'll be out of your hair because it's been a long one. India saved $2.7 billion by importing discounted Russian oil in the first nine months of 2023, according to calculations based on government data. Russia has surpassed Iraq as top oil supplier to India, with Saudi Arabia relegated to third place. My goodness, what I wonder here is... Um, whether that increase in the buying of Russian hydrocarbons by places like India might sound good, but if they're buying them and send with Kazakhstan at lower rates, then obviously that doesn't really help what Russia had previously budgeted for. And so, yeah, it, it, it might not be the best news, even though it is, you know, increased uh, I importation of Russian hydrocarbons. Anyway, uh, this has been a long one. I've, I've split these two, uh, these videos, this second video into two because it was just a bit too long. Anyway, uh, please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate all your, uh, all your support. Take care and speak soon. Toodle pips.